Welcome to Drinking in Utah. I'm your Drink Master General. My name is Josh. And I'm Jared. And we are up in Park City. It's our first show outside of Salt Lake. We are at Flanagan's. World traveling. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm thirsty. Very thirsty. Yeah, let's grab it let's in. Let's do it. Flanagan's is an Irish pub located at 483 Main Street in downtown Park City. They have real stick-to-your-ribs authentic Irish food like shepherd's pie and bangers and mash, as well as some great surprises like these blackened ahi crustinis. The staff was fantastic and let us have the entire downstairs of the bar to film in. It's a great place to hole up in a snug and maybe down a few car bombs like these fellas. Nicely done, fellas. Nicely done. Um, I know it's getting really frustrating for everyone, but uh, Ty Burrell couldn't make it. He no. was, I think he was at the Golden Globes or something last night. Yeah, Ricky Gervais made fun of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, so maybe next week. But we have a great fill-in guest. Plan B. Yeah, we have Rob Lee. He's a realtor. Uh, that's what everyone knows you for. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe a couple other things too. Like what? There might be a little Ultimate World Triathlon in there. Uh, what I don't know what that is. Yeah, what's? Uh, I self-proclaimed and made up this uh, uh, ultimate world triathlon, and I decided in one year I would uh, try to swim the English Channel. Um, I would bike across the U.S. and for my run, I would climb Everest. Uh, so we'll for your that. Wow. Oh, okay. It's actually quadrathlon because I also got married in the middle of that as well. So nice. We'll go with that. That was probably the hardest one. Of it was. <laughs> Most committing. <laughs> scariest. Yeah. yeah. It's still going on with it. God, Jared. Forever. These are all real estate questions. I don't know what to tell you, bud. I only got like five trivia questions. <sighs> uh, all right. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Ultimate World uh, Ultimate World Triathlon. Ultimate World Triathlon. Ultimate yep. World Triathlon. And what was the, the genesis of that? Yeah, so, uh, let's see. At this point, it was about four years ago. I was having some ankle Buffalo. problems. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize oh. for interrupting you. You had a Buffalo story four years ago? No, we have an ongoing game and I've never got uh -huh. him. So basically we play this game to where if you're ever drinking with your dominant hand, which he was, you have to finish your beer immediately. Got it. He's got me several times. I've been waiting on that. Like, yep. I apologize for interrupting. No, you're fine. I'm just so happy I now right remember now. the game, so you're, you're good. You're good. <laughs> you can play along if you want. Sure, why not? <laughs> nice. I'm in. Uh, so yeah, I was uh, having some ankle issues. I've had ankle issues for a long time. I broke the end of my fibula off a few times. And so um, I went in to see if I needed surgery and sure enough, I did need surgery. And the doctor said, you know, medically speaking, you really shouldn't be running anymore. Um, uh, basically, I was getting arthritis in my ankles. And so I immediately thought like I needed a new athletic challenge. I come from like a swimming background, but also a triathlon background. and so. Um, literally sitting on the doctor's table, I decided I was going to swim the English Channel uh, because I'm a swimmer and that's like this kind of big thing to do in swimming. But little did I know how different it was from swimming, even from like triathlon swimming where you're in the open water. As I started uh, researching the English Channel, um, I found out they call it the Everest of swimming. Oh. And uh, there's kind of debates online, which is harder, the Everest or swimming the English Channel. And uh, people go back and forth. And I was like, I wonder if anybody's ever done both. It turned out, I think at the time, like eight, maybe nine people had done it when, um, when I was researching this. Uh, but no one had done it in the same year. So I thought, if I try to do it in the same year, maybe I could really try to compare the two. Uh, but because of my triathlete background, I was like, ah, I gotta throw in a bike. I've always wanted to bike across the country, so why not throw that in? Um, but then as it, as it worked out with like the timing of all these different events, uh, I was trying to do it within like a calendar year and instead it happened in a six month period. It really jammed them in and yeah. that, that is really what made them all difficult. They're, they're all, they weren't, none of them are of course gimmies. Uh, I thought they were all within my wheelhouse, but I didn't, um, you know, I didn't know how it was all gonna work out, but jamming them together made it quite difficult. Yeah, I can imagine. I, I would I would vote the English Channel because I get winded getting out of the bathtub. Yeah. I was gonna say with the uh, with the English Channel, I heard that you. Yeah, nice. um, I like that you had to put on a lot of weight to do it. I did. Really? Yeah. Yep. 
I had a beer and a pizza sponsor, like, talk about the ultimate athletic challenge. No way. Yeah. And, well, I have to throw in that I was drinking about two quarts of heavy cream a week. And, you know, that went in my coffee. There was probably a few white Russians involved in that. Solid. Yeah, yeah. Solid. Yeah, because for buoyancy or warmth? Or uh, warmth, the... yeah. So the water is, uh, I mean, it depends on the time of year. When I did it, it was about 61 degrees, but I have to plan from anywhere from like 59 to maybe 62 degrees. And uh, honestly, that doesn't sound like a huge difference, but one degree makes a massive difference when you're in that, that cold water without a wetsuit for that long. And so um, that was my biggest crux. I actually thought, I was pretty confident that I could swim that long, um, but I didn't know if I could withstand the cold. And how far, it's, what's the distance? It's 21 miles as the crow flies. Okay. Um, with the tides, uh, if you kind of can imagine the English Channel, um, basically the tides are pushing you one way and then the other, so my watch at the end, my GPS, said uh, 28 miles. Damn. I use that as a crow's fly for everything I do now. <laughs> like, no matter where I go, yeah, it's, that's a crow's fly. Like, that's cool. I don't know. I like the GPS tracker. I mean, I can say I swam 28 miles. That's but so I did get a little help from the tides with that, right? Really? Yeah. yeah I mean, oh, they're kind of pushing you to the yeah. side, but you do get some assistance with okay. it at yeah. certain times. Yeah. Now, uh, anyone who follows you on Instagram has seen you in a Speedo multiple times. Now, was, did, was your uh, love of swimming before your love of Speedos, or is it vice versa? I think they just go together, right? Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. I grew up as a swimmer. I'm totally comfortable in a Speedo. But what's kind of ironic about maybe, like, the photo that you probably saw was um, Caroline, my now wife, uh, took a photo of me right before the swim. And that was, like, the heaviest I've ever been because I bulked up for the English Channel. Yeah. And I'm drinking, like, a Red Bull, and I'm just kind of, like, I don't know, to me, I look like, I feel a little gross. And when I was gaining all this weight, like it sounds great to be able to eat and drink whatever you want, yeah. but at a certain point, you just don't feel that well. Yeah, yeah. And, um, I, you know, it sounds funny, but like, you know, uh, body image is always kind of associated with women. And I think it's not actually talked about enough with men because I kind of felt that a little bit. Yeah. I w wasn't as comfortable with my Speedo as I normally am. Yeah. And that, that was kind of interesting in the whole, um, conversation of, uh, I did this whole Ultimate World Triathlon as a hashtag try for equality, talking about gender equality. Um, and in this case, I thought the roles were a little bit reversed that men men in some of these issues aren't talked about enough. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. But uh, yeah, that was probably like the most shared photo of me of all time. <laughs> and it happens to be like my fattest point in life now, in a Speedo. Now what like, there, there's one, there's also one where you're in your Speedo holding your bike above your head. Yes, that was right before the bike ride. And, you yeah. know, again, I'm just kind of embracing the moment a little yeah, bit. Yeah. I, at that time, I thought I was going to lose a lot of weight after the English Channel and get ready for the bike ride. But I had this little thing called the wedding in between. Mm. And so I kind of had to concentrate on that and work on that. And then um, I showed up to the bike ride still way over my normal weight. And I thought I would ride myself into shape. And this is what made the whole Ultimate World Triathlon a lot, a lot harder than I thought is I didn't really get to train for the bike ride. Mm. I, I, you know, I've biked my whole life and everything else. And I had biked even before like going to Everest. But um, in between the swim and the bike, I mean, all summer, before I started this uh, bike ride, I probably rode my bike like six times. Mm. And then I had to jump on the bike and start riding 100 miles a day for 39 straight days. And I thought after, <laughs> I thought I would ride myself into shape. What I didn't take into account is that you have to have rest to ride yourself into shape. And I didn't take any rest right. days. Right. And so I, I thought after 10 days I'd be all right. And that was not really the also, case. Also, I, I bike a fair amount. And I know that you have to get your ass into bike shape. Yeah. And like your actual ass? Yeah, like okay. your your, Saddle source. your butt That's gets used to being on the bike. Okay. Yeah. But yours was not muscles, yeah, no. Probably do. one of the worst things about the bike ride was the saddle sores and it was something I just have to deal with and um, I had a Utah kind of, I, you know, I don't know if I'd call them a sponsor, but they supported me and they sent me some product, uh, Deez Nuts, and yeah. it's a great little product. It's like a cream and it helps out and I tried some other concoctions and those definitely helped, but as you're saying, like I was not ready for it, and it was painful for the first hour and the last hour of every ride. It was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> did you wake up and go, "Oh my God, I do not want to get on this bike again"? Every day. But yeah. then, when you started riding, were you like, "I'm glad to be on the bike"? Um, After maybe the for hour. the most part, yes. Yeah. So the first, the best part about the first like hour is I was 
generally starting at sunrise and you're in a new place and you're like, wow, this is really cool. Yeah. But I'm constantly doing this on the bike to try to get like a little bit comfortable. And then uh, after like an hour and you know, kind of in the groove, then it's usually better. And for the most part, yeah, like the middle part of the ride was mostly okay. And it was towards the end of the ride, you're like, I need to get off this bike. Yeah, this is ridiculous. Now. Yeah, <laughs> 99 be damned, yeah. I need yeah. to get off now. Yeah. So with Everest, your wife, now wife, yep. um, she tore ACL six weeks before you guys were supposed to go? Yep. And Seven, sorry. Still went. Yeah. Yep. Still summited. Yep. That's pretty incredible. Really incredible. Yeah, she had to show me up, you know? Yeah. Uh, no, she's just, uh, she's awesome. And she's a warrior and she went for it. Um, it was one of those things, literally we paid our last Everest payment, which was the bulk of our Everest money. And as you can imagine, Everest is an extremely expensive endeavor. Yeah. So we paid that, and the next day is when she tore her ACL. Oh, no and way. we had looked into insurance, but it was like extremely expensive and not really in the cards. And so we didn't we didn't do it. I mean, we're not talking like, oh, it was a couple hundred bucks and we didn't do it. it was, I think it was like $10,000 per person to get insurance. And so we Just didn't do it. Just to climb it or the insurance, knowing she tore her ACL? No, it was, yeah. if we, before she tore her ACL, we looked into okay. insurance in case we needed to cancel and the insurance would have cost like $10,000. Okay. And so it was just not really feasible, so we didn't do it, and then of course she tore her ACL. Um, we got her into some of the doctors here in Park City, which are some of the knee doctors, the best in, I would say, the country, but really, literally the world. Um, and they basically said, look, you can probably rehab your knee and go climb Everest and just kind of take it day by day, um, and you might be able to do this, you might be able to pull it off. If you do surgery, it's not gonna happen. So the whole thought process, because she needed more recovery if you did that. So um, she had enough like muscles to stabilize her knee, and of course she wore a brace as well to help with that. Um, but uh, then she had surgery four days after we returned. So she's awesome, she crushed it, and it, it's incredible. Which, yeah. What's something that, that when you're on Everest, when you're in camp, that they don't tell you what what's what was a surprise? Um, I don't know that there was a ton of surprises uh, because we did show you. So I think okay. that that that's that, a similar experience. It's a it's similar experience. It's high. it's definitely um, a little higher, a little more technical. Probably maybe one of the it's not it shouldn't really be a surprise, but you know you, you do see dead bodies up there, mm. and that's like a little bit mentally like. A little bit of a yeah. mind. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if I can say. So we'll. You know, no, you can say, oh, you can say mind yeah, fuck mind for fuck, sure because yeah. it's chipping me out. You talking about? Um, it. <laughs> yeah. So you know, you definitely see that. Um, I, I guess like the general, the first thing that came to mind when you asked that was, um, you, you just we call it like low grade suffering. You just for the entire time you're there, and we did a rapid ascent, which was like 40, supposed to be 40 days, and it ended up being 45 with the weather. Um, most people spend 60 to 70 days up there and the entire time you're at those elevations, you just don't feel good. Yeah. You feel like you have a cold and sinuses and um, like, I, I'm a great sleeper and I need my sleep and on Everest you wake up, particularly uh, at base camp and advanced base, camp, uh, advanced base camp, I would wake up like every hour and I actually dreaded going to sleep because mm. sleep was just really hard and you wake up all stuffed up and you're peeing all the time and you're trying to hydrate because uh, actually part of the way you climatize is through your liver, which is kind of interesting, and you kind of like cleanse it out and it helps you acclimatize. So you're so no drinking as there. much as possible. But even, what's that? No beer up there. I wouldn't go that far. I was oh, gonna say, right. not yeah. even the one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say like on the first part of the trip when you're feeling like crap, it, you definitely don't drink as much. You might have a beer or two or something like that. Um, but uh, as you kind of get used to it a little bit, uh, it's kind of nice to have a, you know, a beer. and pick me up. Or, yeah, Does, yeah. So they always talk about, you know, and it's kind of a wives tale, but when, you know, people come to Park City for Sundance, and they have their, you know, a lot of these celebrities yep. have a malfunction. Yep. And they're like, it's the altitude. What, did the alcohol hit you harder when you're up higher? I would say, definitely say, you can definitely feel it yeah. more. Okay. But I mean, we were never uh, looking to get like wasted up there. Right. You're, you're looking to, you know, like enjoy a brewski. I mean, I took, uh, we took brewskis and we had um, some vodka and we had some, I think, bourbon, scotch or whatever. Wine, definitely had wine. So like, I mean, but it, it, you're more having like a drink or two a night instead of like more than that. Yeah. Let's yeah, uh, recreate that, that scene where you have the vodka at base camp. Oh yeah. There's Rock a couple, couple, of, couple of shots. What's happening? Yeah, we'll get a happen. couple of shots in there. Let's make it happen. Producer Dan. Uh, 
Producer D. Oh, that poor me. Why is mine not the same color? Because. Uh oh. Oh, shit. Oh, I could have called you on it, right? Oh, yeah. well, we're you, have to drink. Buffalo, you have to drink. It's Buffalo. Yeah, Buffalo. All right, we'll do that too. Nice. Yeah. Uh, where are we? How many beers did you take up there with you, or did someone provide them? Uh, we had uh, a certain amount uh, that the uh, guiding company we went with, Alpine Glow Expeditions, had. Um, on, so we went from the north side, and most people go from the south side, and that was on purpose because of probably what a lot of people saw, like the crowds oh, on right, the yeah. south side, right? So we went with a completely different route because there's less people in the mountain. Um, and on our side, you can actually drive to base camp. So um, 17,000 feet, you're on the Tibetan plateau, you basically drive in there. So at base camp, you have a lot of kind of luxuries in, in a sense. I mean, you're still in a tent and all this stuff, but you, you know, you have a lot more than you would other places. Um, so we took a handful of fat tires there because fat tire has supported us and we want to support them. Um, and then uh, we can support local. us too. Oh. Fat tire, if you're watching mm -hmm. this, we'll take free beer. <laughs> yeah. Was there a local beer that you walked away with? Yeah, Sorry, I'm just saying. Was it good? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I in case I'm ever asked that. <laughs> and it's, uh, I can picture it's green beer. I'm just trying to remember the freaking name right now. Uh, see, the problem is I lived at high elevation for a while, so my mind is not quite as clear as it should be. Um, I'll have to get back to you on that one. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, did you have a beer after the summit and after your swim and when you reached uh, Maryland, right? Uh, uh, actually, it was Nantucket, Nantucket, so it was Massachusetts, yeah. yeah, um, um, Absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. And which, uh, which was the best beer of the three? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah, oh, about that? caught me off guard, too. Uh, <laughs> Dinger. I'm going to go with, uh, with the bike ride. And the main reason is not necessarily the previous, like, you know, getting through the event or whatever, but um, it was because it was in an outdoor shower in Nantucket. It was kind of stormy around, and I was like, beer, shower, finished, not only with the bike ride, but the whole Ultimate World Triathlon. Like, I mean, I actually have, like, this photo of it, and it, I, I'd, like, almost get emotional looking yeah. at the photo. I'm, yeah. That was the moment. Like, I could let it go. I'm like, I'm done. Yeah. Back so, to being yeah. me. That's yeah. awesome. Are you tired of talking about it? No. I mean, it, it was a big thing. And uh, of course, like, yeah, you, you answer a lot of the same questions and stuff like that. But uh, it was a huge part of my life. And I, I hope to continue to talk about it. And um, of course, that part, I think, will die off a little bit. I want the conversation about gender equality to um, go on and I want people to have conversations about that and I, I think that that's that has happened but I need to make sure that that still happens I think that's potentially more of a lasting legacy because someone will come around and they'll like literally just double what I did or something like that they'll do like a double English channel crossing and right. some of it from both sides I mean people are amazing right yeah. so um, if there's any kind of lasting legacy I want it to be um, whether it's one guy uh, 10 guys, 100 guys, 1,000 guys that make some lifestyle change to uh, uh, respect women and uh, make them more equal in our society. I think that's more of a lasting legacy I can talk about. We're thematic and you're not. He has a bike, I have a mountain, you don't have shit. He biked, yeah. he climbed, he the and he swam. Bus. But you can tell him yeah. not to do that. But I did <laughs> swim basically in England, so that's just kind of like NSS. I'm just trying to shit on you. Did you, like the, <laughs> did you have cask ales while you were in England? Uh, yes, but I'm trying to think what I like not be. You know. I had a fat tire first, and then I had, let's see, I had gin and tonics, because that's like total like I, uh, England, UK thing. Yep. They're way into that. And then I had some Aperol spritz. Because okay. it was like super refreshing. Yep. My mouth was jacked from the salt water mm. for like three days because you're in the salt oh my water. God, I didn't like think of that. It's yeah. the it's the when you're talking about this, it's the weird <laughs> shit that I don't even think of. And when you mention it, it's just like, oh yeah, that I, I. Well, that's a perfect segue. Let's talk about jellyfish. Yeah, jellyfish were. Did you think of those? I I read up a little bit, and I, I I'm scared to death to hear the story though. <laughs> now you you're. I'm gonna say you and Caroline are the king and queen of type two fun. Yep, we enjoy it for sure. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and so when you when I read that you were like kind of excited to get stung by a jellyfish because it would wake you up. I thought, a adrenaline shot. I thought he's a little different breed than I am. Yep. Um, but then how many of those 
did hit you until you were like, okay, I'm done. Yeah, I mean, I, I've told people Good 50, idea. 100, maybe more, but it's really hard to say because a lot of times you're not getting like one jellyfish that you hit. Uh, actually, probably kind of the most intense feeling. Um, there'd be certain sections where uh, with the tides and the way the, it's like a shipping lane through the English Channel. And so there'd be like these sections of like kind of seagrass um, that are just kind of chopped up like seaweed and seagrass. Mm. And in that, there's chopped up jellyfish as well, oh. which means there's like just tentacles, right? Just, so yeah. like you, you either get like a tiny ting or like the whole thing, or, you know, I, I had two direct blows to the face yeah. that were like super oh, painful, no. right? And then I had one time that I, um, I just finished what's called a feeding, basically. Like you stop and they give you food from the food and water from the boat. And I, I, I you know, usually I can kind of like a little bit maneuver around the jellyfish, um, if at least if I see them. But this time there was like dozens right in front of me. I'm like, there's no way around this, and I had to just swim through probably like 20 jellyfish. And it was just kind of like, yeah, you know, just this almost like shocking feeling. You just kind of I got to go for it, and then. Ride the adrenaline. <laughs> oh my God, that's crazy. Is there a danger to getting too many? Yeah, I, that's what I thought about him. Like, it was after about three hours of, I would say, getting stung like at least 25 times per hour, um, I was like, okay, I'm dealing with this fine. Like, this is okay, I'm okay. But if this goes on for another 10 hours, like, a, is my mind gonna be okay? But it also, like, am I gonna get some kind of like toxicity yeah, in my body or right. something like that? And the only thing I would say is like, I was getting stung by a compass jellyfish, which are, um, I mean, they don't feel good, but like it's a sting and it's not like the worst thing you've ever felt. Like maybe like bee sting or something like that. Uh, let's talk about the uh, quality, try for quality. Yeah. Big Mountain Dreams Foundation. Yeah. That was, you, did you guys find that before everything and then this was part of it? How, yeah, we founded that just over a year ago. Okay. Um, and the idea was kind of a intersectionality between environment and equality and how these things play off of each other and basically, honestly, just being better humans and whatnot. Um, the, the Try for Equality kind of came about um, particularly, I mean, I would say from my relationship with Caroline, she's a professional athlete, um, but I kind of noticed that even if I wasn't the expert and we were out and about, people approach me rather than her. Maybe that's not true if they knew who knew, know her as a professional athlete, but generally, um, like we go to New Zealand and go ski mountain, we go in and ask for avalanche conditions and we're gonna go try to ski mountain cook, right? Like an insane line. And they kind of look at her and almost like laugh like the, the you know, the avalanche people or something like that and they want to direct their attention to me or the best example would be right when we started um, backcountry skiing I was I was an athlete but I was really new to backcountry skiing she was yeah. literally a professional backcountry skier ski mountaineer and if we were out in the backcountry people would approach her and um, or sorry they would approach me and be like where are you going or what are you seeing out there as far as abbey conditions and stuff like that and I realized, realized not at the time but after years of this, that they're just doing that because I'm 6'1", I'm a taller, white male, and they just thought I was like guiding her, taking her into the mountains, but it was literally the upper, uh, other way around. She yeah. was literally teaching me uh, the way. And, uh, I see that in a lot of things, and I see her not getting the same pay and different things like this in, in different contracts. Um, I mean, you know, you make the best out of it, but you do start to see this implicit bias as well. Yeah. And then I, I even realized even certain things that I was doing in life, um, I was probably adding to the problem. And uh, kind of a, a good example is in my real estate career, um, if I read a contract or really anybody, I don't think it's just me, almost all the time, unless you're told to do otherwise, you put the, the man's name first and then the woman's. And um, it, it literally means nothing in the ownership of a home or a condo or whatever someone's buying. But it, it's kind of this really subtle way of women always kind of being put second to the man. Yeah. Um, and so there's these little things that I think we do in everyday life that we just don't realize we're doing. And some of them are bigger deals than others. Some of them it's implicit bias and some of it's like literally just being sexist or biased. And I don't know that I'm gonna change the world or change any truly sexist person's mind. But I think that if we have these conversations about um, how we talk to or about women or these little implicit bias things, I think we can make a change for the yeah. better. And Caroline is, I think, the most active 
just for, for climate change, for quality. I mean, she's always doing stuff. The, today she was uh, organizing a climate march. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure when this is going to air, but uh, if you're going to outdoor retailer um, in okay. Denver at the end of the uh, end of January, um, then uh, let's see on Friday, the last day, I believe at noon, we're going to do a climate strike. And when I say we, I don't want to take any credit. This is Caroline organize this. I'm going to try to help out as much as possible, but um, I think it's important. And uh, whether you're going to OR or you work or in Denver or around that area, join us. Uh, we're going to walk from the convention center, I believe at noon, uh, to the Capitol building. It's about, I think, 0.9 miles. Cool. And then uh, have some people talk there, and it's going to be a cool thing. Yeah, very nice. cool. Awesome. Okay. We'll minus for you, huh? I got a, I got a, I got a summit. This is this one right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> yeah. uh, six pack of questions. These are everyone on the show answers these same six questions. The hose is gonna open six beers or however many it takes. What is something that you love that everyone hates, or something that you hate that everyone loves? Ice. Pass. I mean, I, yeah. The first thing we just talked about, about this. I would say the ice bass is like something that is. Probably like this narcissistic thing, or like the yeah. jellyfish, where jellyfish I'm like, oh, you know, like these things. I, I'm like, oh, it makes me feel alive, and yeah. people are like, that sounds terrible. So yeah, I think that's probably yeah. okay. Uh, first time you drank, and the story behind it. Uh, I mean, there's probably like, you know, the sip of beer or like whatever at a uh, a family thing or something like, like that. You know. Really, like, heavy yeah, I would say I would say uh, that would be. My Freshman year in high school, in a sand pit, on a golf course, Wait, with some kind of golf? weird yes. drinking. Yeah, it was Strange. some kind of weird concoction. I, I think it was probably like a vodka and a um, fruity drink, something rather. But I, I don't remember exactly. And then <laughs> it was terrible. I yeah, I remember like you know drinking it, like sitting down and then standing up and falling over and being like. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's, That's nice. terrible. That's, That's always nice. God. Yeah. If you have a drink named after you, what would be in it and what would be called? Uh, we'll go with the Wet Loose Roberto. I think there's some thought behind that. I would love yeah. to hear that. So I have a tendency, uh, although every time we're in the mountains and we're like ski touring, we are very cognizant of the conditions of what we're doing, I have a tendency to start these what are called like wet loose avalanches which are these really slow avalanches that you can kind of get away with from but like uh, I just I, I sometimes I start them and we're always You're not mitigating it so I no I'm not necessarily starting them on purpose but like I might start them and we're in safe places so it's okay and I can get away from them and people below me are away from them but like yeah so I, I had a nickname wet loose Roberto so I, I think that's got to be the name. Yeah, I like um, that's a great name. What was the second part of the question? What's in it? What was the drink? Ooh, you guys might have to help me with that one. Okay. Um, what is, I, I have I mean, an idea, but it's really gross. Okay. It is every single beer he chugged. So after he summoned it, he chugged that. After he rode and after he swam, he chugged a certain beer. Put them all together, and then that's your drink. Hmm. Yeah, so I know. Fat tire is a wet loose Roberto. Oh yeah, I guess oh, it's just three, just three in a row. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, wait. So, what if you did like the fat tire? My other drink of this like triathlon was the uh, uh, White Russian. Okay. Mm. And partly with the training and being in Europe or whatever, I had some Aperol Spritz. So maybe you combine all those. Well, that sounds like a terrible. You did the well, you did the triathlon. I think they should I mean, all be like lined milk up. And, and oh, Kahlua that's a rough, and rough triathlon. Yeah, yeah, you got drink. beer. Yo, oh, man, this. I like it. Yeah. Or you have to line them all up and finish them like this fast. Yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah. There you go. That, that, that would I be like that, better, actually. And then you have a wet, loose morning. Oh, God. <laughs> Dear Lord, you had to go there, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, your favorite thing about Utah, and then your least favorite thing about Utah. Uh, I mean, I, I would have to say the environment here, right? Like, uh, well, I mean, I guess, like, my family's here. So yeah. I don't want to look past that. But uh, we live here because oh. of the, the lifestyle we live. For sure, um, the skiing and the mountain biking and access to Southern Utah and all the things that we do, and honestly, like we have an international airport, so we get to go to all these other places. Right. But it, it is here; it's local. I like to stick here as much as possible. The least, what can I say? Not offend to me? No, I'm just kidding. Um, I would, I would just say 
probably honestly the stigma of it. I mean, like, I don't know if that's my least favorite thing about Utah, but like, there's not a whole lot I really don't like. Actually, I do have something. Air quality. Yep. Yes. God, I think I've everyone, been waiting. I think everyone is. It ha- yeah. If you do, I was, I was like actually wondering. I was like, we're above it. And I yep. wondered yeah. if, you were, if you were like, yeah. Well, it's completely opposed to what I just said. It's all about like being here and doing things we love and the environment yep. and the lifestyle. And that is like our biggest threat to that lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So 100% that, that's going to be my answer. Yeah. yeah. It sucks. Yeah. If you could have a drink with anyone alive or dead, who would it be? Oh, I probably should have this answer like down. Yeah, you're but I to don't. Sure. You just got married. You're supposed to say, "My wife." It's not all the time, man. <laughs> um, gosh, uh, might need to have a second here. That's all right. Yep. This uh, is the classic. Yeah, well, uh, we <laughs> totally summited that beer. Oh. I am gonna go with. I think this is a silly answer, but because I can't think of anything else right now, I'm gonna go with Barack Obama. I'd love to sit down with Barack. Oh uh, yeah. So we can see how see how the show went down. Yeah. See what his last decade was like. Yeah. Chat with him. See how to be. I think he has done a lot of good things in this world, and see how to be influential and, um, and chat. With him. Yeah, I love that. Huh? And then tomorrow morning or afternoon when you wake up, yeah. uh, what's your go-to hangover cure? Uh, I would say exercise. Yeah. yeah. So probably the best um, and the worst, but um, essentially if you have a bad hangover, it, it can be bad. But uh, honestly, jumping in the pool and swimming some laps, okay. like there's something about hitting the water yep. at 6 a.m. Yep. It's going to wake you up, and then after an hour of exercise, sweating it out and kind of getting out of your system. That's the best way. Yep. Yep. Nice. Yep. Well, it's last call. This is when you get to plug whatever you've got going on. What you want people to know about. Oh, um, I think the, the biggest thing would be just the, the kind of the extension of the tri quality. So it's the, um, having these conversations, particularly as men. And, um, you know, when you hear something that somebody says, uh, a lot of times another guy or something like that, it's easy to kind of laugh about that and kind of like joke about it and kind of let it go or something like that. But um, kind of being the voice uh, of reason, it's a really difficult thing to do. And I've had, I had to ask a couple like kind of uncomfortable questions of people, but I think it makes a huge difference. Um, so that, and uh, just because I'm here with you guys and we're drinking beers, I have to say Fat Tire is really, um, nice. A great company, they're B Corp, which means um, they're, it's not all about the bottom line and the profitability. They're trying to be uh, better for the world, basically. Um, and they have like certain, all these rules about charitable donations and doing right by the world, all these kind of things. So I definitely want to plug them because they've uh, been a supporter of what I'm doing and um, and their beer is great. Yeah. So it's yeah. nice to, to be able to, you know, obviously climb Everest, have a beer or a couple. Uh, same thing with the, the swim and the bike, so. Yeah, nice. Yeah, and check out uh, Fat Tire. You can, if you go to Fat Tire's Instagram, their Instagram TV, you can see their video of Rob's try, which yep. is really is that. That's great. Awesome. Just a short little, yeah. I think it's like three, three and a half minutes, minutes or something, or something like yeah. that, yeah. Yeah, it's great. So, uh, awesome. Join us next time. Producer Dan, our guest is going to be You'd be amazed, but we've actually had a real breakthrough in the Ty Burrell thing. <laughs> okay, listen, the last Ty Burrell turns out he actually was named Ty Burrell, but he was an elderly man out in Heber, and he really did want me to show up with cameras, yeah. but he didn't want to do a show about, <laughs> yeah, about, oh. about drinking. Yeah, <laughs> but this next time. It's yeah, the no, real we're, we're good to go. Yeah. Sweet. All, All right. right, yeah. Join us next yes. time. Ty Burrell will be here. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, cool. that's it. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Appreciate it. Is that right? Arriba, Bajo, a centro, a centro. Oh, sure.